tank, uh, to supervise that tank while you're under. You're paying for the human services behind that air. Now, all of a sudden, air has a price. Air is scarce. It has to be provided by people. So, basically what you have is you have real wealth and you have a medium of exchange. And the real problem is here is that people have confused the two. Currency, paper in your wallet, or silver and gold is not wealth. It's only what you use to get wealth. What is it you want in life? Do you want a house? Do you want food? Do you want uh, an education for your kid? Okay, silver and gold isn't wealth. Silver and gold is just what you trade to get those things when you want them. Now under barter, you would have to, if, even if you could find someone who'd give them to you for the trade for the exact thing you wanted, you would have to use it right then. With money, finally you can save, you can plan for the future, and now you can make decisions based on future events instead of just whatever you think is going to happen at the moment. So when you pump this fake money in, basically what you do is you devalue the currency because there's more supply of it, it's less scarce, and in relation to the things people want, there's no more of the things people want. So you have more people that have the money to buy the same number of things. So if you have 50 lawnmowers, and originally before the credit expansion, before the government gives away a bunch of money, stimulus, uh, you have, say, 50 people with enough money to pay the price for those lawnmowers. Now you hand out all this money and you have 100 people with enough money to meet that current price of the lawnmowers. What's going to happen? Are there going to be enough lawnmowers for everyone who has the money to buy them and wants them? There's going to be what's called a shortage. Okay. So inevitably what happens in order to get the lawnmowers to the people who need them the most, the people who are willing to spend the most money on them, the people who sacrifice other needs because they really need this lawnmower or whatever it is, all right, the price has to rise so that the people who don't really need it and don't really want it aren't going to buy it. They're going to buy something else. So this is the problem with the inflationary boom. And what happens is eventually entrepreneurs, businessmen, uh, anyone who's going to invest some money, which is basically all of us really, uh, are going to make investment decisions based on this new money being printed. Okay, money is suddenly more available. We think we have more money than we really do because it takes time for prices to rise in relation to this new money being printed. So what happens is we think we have all this money to invest and we go ahead and then we invest. Maybe we invest in housing because the government is subsidizing housing, giving te tax credits. Or maybe they're allowing to give us mortgages and we don't have to prove our income or give a down payment or have a job or good credit. And or maybe they are pumping so much money into Wall Street that the Wall Street people are putting money into speculative investments uh, in the uh, worthless computer sites, the websites that don't produce anything. Okay? That's how the dot-com bubble, but so all this money has to go somewhere that they print. It goes into these things that pe people think they're going to make money on. But what happens when prices start to rise, and most recently with the housing crisis, we saw this with gas prices. Gas prices started to rise with the first housing bust, and suddenly people couldn't pay their mortgages. And you have the bust. Okay, this is the inevitable outcome of the original inflation. As interest rates, which hasn't, hasn't happened yet, the government, we're going to get to interest rates in a second, the government's suppressing the interest rates, but as the debt rises, first of all, people get skittish about the banking system. They start realizing that maybe the bank doesn't really have any money, and so you can start having runs on the bank, which is why they wanted to bail out the banks, right? They were worried that people would have a run on the bank and collapse the banking system. Uh, and people worry about inflation. People worried about inflation, see, they make different economic decisions that aren't necessarily good for the economy. They're going to dump their dollars and buy anything in sight that's of real value, even if it's something they don't care. So they're going to start what's called hoarding. All right, so eventually, and then eventually what we're going to face real soon is rising interest rates. And what happens with rising interest rates is because we have this increased debt, the people who loaned us this money start to realize, you know what, they're not going to pay this money back. They can't pay this money back. And so they start demanding higher interest rates 
on that loan that they've given. And suddenly our $100 trillion national debt, if you count the unfinished mandates, we're over $100 trillion, can become 100 million times that in a period of a month because if interest rates go from 1%, 2% that they are now to 15, 20, 30%, the entire, let's, we'll just give you an example. The entire income tax paid by every American inside the United States doesn't pay for any services that the American people think they're getting. <coughs> if every cent of it goes to pay interest on the national debt already. So if you can imagine that interest number skyrocketing, then you'll see that immediately the income tax won't even pay that. It won't even pay the interest on the debt soon, which means the actual debt, of course, is growing. And we already see what's happening now, China, Japan, uh, um, India, they are not buying our debt anymore. You know, we sell our debt, the U.S. Treasuries, and they're, they're, they're starting to say, you know what, we're not going to buy your debt anymore. This is the inevitable bust, and by delaying these busts all along the housing, see, with the dot-com busted, what did they do? They reinflated a new bubble in housing. When the housing reflated, they've been trying to re reinflate housing, but people are too smart and they're not buying anyway, but they are inflating commodities, where I, 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 I do my action, okay? They are increasing the price of commodities, gas, food. I don't know if you notice it at the grocery store, but you're paying more money for food. You might not see the prices going up, but the size, the containers of the product is shrinking. This is the inevitable consequence of printing new currency. So we've had a bust, a bust, a bust, over and over and over this boom bust cycle, but now, we, because foreigners are not going to keep buying our national debt, because the interest rate is, because things have gotten so bad, basically we are going to face the ultimate bubble collapse very soon, and that is the collapse of this counterfeit currency. Now this has happened throughout history. It happened during the American Revolution with what was called the Continental, and that's where the expression came from, that probably most people don't know anymore, not worth a Continental because they had devalued this, this fiat currency to fund Washington's expensive, ridiculously ineffective military. And so basically, very soon, you know, in Austrian economics, what we can say is this policy will tend to create this result, okay? But we don't claim to be able to predict uh, timetables, and we don't necessarily, uh, new, new variables can come in. So say for instance, as bad as things are right now, tomorrow someone invents fusion energy, free energy for the whole world. Well, we're gonna have a boom. And you're gonna have massive new wealth enter society. So when we're talking about Austrian economics, we can only say if all things are equal, this is what's gonna happen. If all these things stay the same, this is the trend of where we're headed. And the trend we're headed right now, first of all, is totalitarianism. And we see that, this, I would say the real personal liberty, totalitarianism started with the drug war, which has been steadily militarizing our police as they become more and more impressive in order to accomplish this totally impossible mission. I mean, if they can't keep drugs out of their own prisons, Obviously, they're not going to keep them out of our houses. Uh, and then, you know, that leads into, I'm just going to cite a few examples of why I think we're in the police state. Uh, we've got the unauthorized wars, where basically we have a president now that's more powerful than any king in the history of mankind. He can unilaterally counterfeit money. He can unilaterally invade other countries. He can unilaterally order the indefinite detention, the kidnapping the torture and the murder of even American citizens anywhere in the world at any time. Uh, you know, so, uh, and then, you know, we've got the universal health mandate, which I, I'm bringing in because this takes us back full circle to the American Revolution.